Hi guys, David Ornstein here. The following clip is a section taken from my podcast, the Ornstein and Chapman podcast. You can listen to the rest of the weekly show for free wherever you get your podcasts and of course ad-free when you subscribe to The Athletic. I hope you enjoy it. You were seen as an innovator and you were, but the perception was that clubs caught Arsenal up and then you didn't reinvent and push ahead of them again. Mm. Now we know a lot of the circumstances, thanks to your book and your explanations. But towards the end especially, there were some quite brutal defeats. I think back to Chelsea on your 1,000th game in charge, 8-2 at Old Trafford. People said, even now the style has gone. Did you feel you were losing control of what you had built from the start? Liverpool just lost 7-2 at Villa. Would you say they have lost their style? You know, I think a big defeat is never really an assessment of, of a quality of a team. And when you look at the, we lost at Chelsea heavily, uh, but uh, with 10 men, we lost at Man United day two, it's true. But after having played at Udinese three days before, in an unbelievable heat, where half of the team could not play on Saturday, and we qualified. So uh, you have uh, always to take a little bit, analyze a little bit deeper to make assessment. Did we have uh, were we less good than the 2004 team? Yeah, of course. But uh, uh, the 2004 team was exceptional because after you had you have still fantastic teams. Nobody was unbeaten the whole scene. How do you feel when people say, look at Sir Alex Ferguson, he reinvented his backroom staff, he made changes. Yeah, he's right. And that you didn't and should have, they say. Yeah, I don't deny that, but uh, Alex Ferguson had, uh, when you you see they had Ronaldo, Rooney, Van Nistelrooy, Giggs, Scholes, when you see the career of these players, what a great team they had, and we still managed to beat them. And they had not the financial restrictions. Where did Van Persie go? To Man United. Why? Because they could afford the wages we couldn't afford. So, and uh, where did uh, all the players go? To Man City. Why? Because they could pay the wages we couldn't afford to pay. So at the end of the day, you know, it's down to economical strengths. Not the changes in the backroom staff. Like when he kept changing assistant managers. I feel... Uh, the backroom staff we had and the, the, the environment of the team we had was top class. Ferguson renovated his staff because he himself was not a lot on the pitch. He needed uh, coaches who uh, maybe to change them because he got vibes that the players now they are tired of uh, having three years of this, three years of that. And uh, he did that very well and I say that in the book, you know. But we had a different way, a different way to manage and uh, we had different uh, financial resources as well. You tell some beautiful stories about the signing of Ndai, essentially in a car park, yeah. of Lillian Turam, who you changed his flight when he was at the airport. Yes. Can you tell me your, your favourite or a couple of memories where that or similar happened at Arsenal that maybe people don't know about? I know about Park Chu Young diverting on the Eurostar when he got your... Yes, yes. Uh, Danny Welbeck when you were at the Match for Peace? Danny Welbeck when I went to the Match for Peace I, at the airport. I've been told he comes down to sign for Tottenham and, uh, <laughs> and I managed to intercept him. In fact, it was a funny story because I was negotiating all day. Uh, we had Ivan and... Uh, uh, Diclo to negotiate and I, they called me up and I had the agent on the phone and I told him, look, I have to hang up because I'm in front of the Pope. He, he said to me, what? I said, yes, because we were queuing up to make a photo with the Pope in a private audience, you know. And uh, because I was at the back of the queue, because I had to talk and negotiate, at some stage I arrived in front of a Pope and I had to say, look, that's not possible anymore. I, I will uh, meet the Pope now. <laughs> and you still signed him. And we still signed him. And there must have been countless examples of both that and also a, any comparable examples to where the Grand Passate director came with you to Cannes uh, to sign a player. He had second thoughts. He said, give me 10 minutes and you were going to rescind your contract yes. if he hadn't signed that player. He did. I told him. And you told him and you got your way. Did anything like that happen at Arsenal? Uh, no, because at Arsenal I had uh, this responsibility to decide in uh, 
who will come in and uh, who will go out, you know. So overall, uh, that was all right. But I think uh, when young coaches advise, ask me for advice now, I always say that to them, you know, you have to clearly define what are your responsibilities inside the club. Are you responsible to buy and sell players or not? Can a player be bought without you? Because coaches are given to their players, they don't even know. They turn up at the training ground in the morning and say, well, who is this? But it is one of your new players. That is why it is important to have a contract specified, clear, and prepare the divorce as well, because the life expectancy of a, of a manager is less than 18 months now. Yeah. So it's humiliating enough to have to go after a short period, but you cannot come in and beg, uh, please, uh, what can you do for me? Why didn't you take Cesc Fabregas back when he wanted to return to Arsenal? Because it was a, a general uh, guidance for me to have that, uh, to make the players say, look, if you go out here, you don't come back. And uh, it was a, a way to retain the players who wanted sometimes to see if the grass is green or somewhere else. I did it for Thierry Henry. So Campbell, Jens Lehmann, but they were so older. So Campbell, Jens Lehmann, but there was different, you know. But the young players who left, I uh, didn't like to do it. Emotion, raw emotion and, and hurt with players. Uh, you've talked in the book about injuries and some guilt you felt around that. What about Emmanuel Aboué leaving the pitch in tears? And conversely, what about Emmanuel Adebayor, a player that you gave the career to and then he celebrated vitriolically in front of your supporters? Well, I would say uh, that was not the best move of his part. You know? <laughs> and uh, But somewhere... He was not convinced to leave Adebayo, you know. And uh, he felt a bit resentment that I pushed him a little bit uh, to go. So that's why I explained it like that. And uh, Emmanuel Eboué, uh, some it happens that he lost it completely. And then you think, I, OK, I comes on and uh, he misses the first pass. You think, OK, it's normal, it goes on. And then the second pass. And then you are in f under threat to uh, lose the game, you have to take him off because there is no other way. And of course, uh, sometimes, uh, many times, you know, that uh, people suffer and uh, feel worthless. The difficult part of our job is we, we produce jobless people on Friday and we employ them again on Monday morning and say nothing happened but now fight again to get in the team uh, on Saturday. The passing of Jose Antonio Reyes must have hurt you. It was terrible because uh, I did fight for him uh, with David Dean, who went to Sevilla and he called me, said, oh, it's difficult here, the, the supporters are outside, the president doesn't want to sell. I, I said to him, I don't care, bring him back, <laughs> you know, bring him with you. And uh, he managed to do it. So he came to us and he was part of a 2003-2004 squad. And in the Champions League final in 2006, I decided not to play him and put Pierre in front of him. That was... He did never like that. And uh, so overall, uh, it was happened the day before the Champions League final, you know, and it was unbelievable. I was in Spain. Uh, it was unbelievable that moment. And it's very sad because his parents came over here as well, you know, to... It was so sad. Mm. I'll finish on a, a much brighter note. Did you ever celebrate properly in a way that nobody knows about. Did you ever get drunk? Did you go to the local restaurant and let loose? You enjoyed some of the most spectacular footballing achievements. Tell us something we don't know, Arsene. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I was drunk one time in my life when I was 18. And uh, since I had sometimes one on the border, you know, but really drunk, no. But uh, I loved after the game to be with my staff and uh, have a quite internal contentment and uh, share the moments of happiness because uh, you suffer together and you celebrate together. You have always to prepare for the next game, you know. And uh, so you think, if I do that tomorrow, I have to manage the guys who didn't play. I have to be uh, focused and concentrated. 
That's the monastic life you talk it about. It is a monastic yeah. life. Yeah. It's a boring life, you know, even for players. You, people think see only the glamour turning up there. Yeah. But it's basically a boring life. You go, practice, go home, sleep, come the next day, practice, play, go back. Uh, and uh, when you play anywhere in the world, yes, you visit every place in the world. But you visit the airport, the hotel and the stadium. Bye bye. All the rest you don't see. It might be boring for you, but it's not been boring for us. Thank you very much. You look incredibly well. Keep smiling and keep giving to the game <laughs> you love. Thank you very much for your kindness.